Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so Mark kind of said it better than I could. I'm here today to talk about uh, Windows detection engineering, specifically different to just writing uh, detections, and we'll have a bit about ELK at the end. But I'm Dan Nash. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, anyway, I'm. Uh, there's more about me. So uh, I now um, I'm part of the security engineering team at Sophos. Um, after working with uh, with Splunk for uh, ESS security with a. Uh, with Harry, um, I used to be much more a part of NUSAC than I am now, I, uh, and, it's, and it's great to see everyone here uh, at their event, it really is fantastic that uh, there's such a great turnout and there's, there, and there's been so many good talks. Um, and I used to work on just uh, detection logic, um, so that's uh, like essentially like endpoint and network um, traces which are left behind which allow us to see why, like, whether something's really bad and then we can react to it instead of finding out about it eight months later when we're in the news. Um, so. I used to work on just the actual logic itself, and since joining Solace, I've discovered there's so much more to it than that. And like, I mean, as, uh, I, I, I was privileged enough to attend Harry's talk earlier about UDA, and like, it's that does highlight a lot of it. So if the if you're watching this recorded, you should go onto the same channel and check that one out as well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start this off with enterprise security is hard, and as security engineers and as people on the defense, we're often on the back foot, or if we don't prepare. We're often on the back foot, and I mean this in two real ways. So first, technically, like modern enterprises are quite specialized and will like uh, suffer different threats. So for instance, um, like uh, businesses which work a lot of email and then like businesses we sell a lot will uh, will come under phishing, will come under um, fake fake CEO threats, while um, software vendors will come under attack from people looking to like hijack. Uh, supply chains and so on and so forth, and all all of these require different detection mechanisms and different protections and all all sorts of things. Um, and even in one business, different silos within the business or different departments will face entirely different threats as well. So if you're a security engineer trying to deal with all this, that's a lot of different things you need to consider. Um, and even in the same departments and even in the same like uh, even in the same processes, different platforms, so like Linux, Windows, and Old mainframes and Mac all require again, like all work slightly differently. All work slightly differently, and will require different protections again, uh, which which means more staff who are the subject matter expert in it, which means collaboration necessary. So schedules have to line up, and it's just it's a lot of drama and it's a lot of work. Um, and socially as well, and security is a cost center. I mean, it's it's Sophos's business to secure other people, but internally it's still a cost, and still a cost we have to justify. And I mean, like, uh, why do much security when you use security do trick, I guess? Like, if there's no clear indicator that uh, taking the cheaper option is going to, like, damage you or make you less money in the future, then why why not do that? A lot of risk, um, which is expensive or inconvenient to mitigate, can be accepted and which, which can lead to a lot of technical debt. So... For uh, for security engineers, uh, we do we do see a lot of uh, a lot of fatalism when we suggest kind of um, suggest more extensive like protection me measures or like uh, oh we're gonna get breached anyway so it doesn't matter or like why like buy this product if if like there's no real point and then a lot of uh, well less so now because it's in the news literally every single day but uh, it's not gonna happen to us so like they're not gonna pick on us or a small company or not or they're not gonna or they're not gonna see this or this is just a dev network we're like. Don't worry about it. And again, with that kind of uh, technical debt, security hygiene has like a major uh, marketing problem because like it's very easy to say, oh yeah, I've got AI, I've got this cool new thing which is going to capture all the threats and like, and I'm just going to like save you loads of money in your sock. But if you actually want, like, a, a, like if if you if you were to pitch, say, okay, I'm going to go back and make sure that all of our uh, that everything's auditable and everything's easy to easy to follow, and that whenever whenever our security team leaves, someone else will be able to take over. Or if we bring a specialist in, it'll be easy to understand. There's a bit less buying for that because there's no real tangible benefit unless you really need it. So, yeah. And there's also I I read an interesting paper while researching this: why information security is hard, an economic perspective. It actually pitches the problem of enterprise security as a problem of perverse incentives. So the people who are controlling the money don't really have the same. Um, motivations as like someone who wants to keep data secure and that this kind of conflict of uh, well the right thing to do would be to do everything we can to keep the data safe and that's going to cost us too much money is going to forever be at play and until we actually fix that there might there, there might be no real solution so to combat this I'm going to very quickly talk about uh, use cases so in enterprise security we tend to manage the problem of endpoint and network security with a program called the SIEM which is a security information and events management tool. Hope I got that right, <laughs> right here. But um, essentially, what 
what we try to do in, in Enterprise is gather all of these logs into one place and then run uh, logic against them to see if there there are things we know are bad behavior <coughs> happening. Because like, we can't look at every individual endpoint and every individual log file to see um, if if live bad stuff is going on. So, and inside these, um, and inside this same tool, we will break up security problems as use cases. Very briefly, the, there's a lot. There's a lot to be said about this topic. So, if you know much about it, there'll probably be some stuff that you know that you know which isn't on here. <laughs> but um, essentially, saying to people, let's just like fix the security of the enterprise doesn't really work. And then because like because there's no direction, there's no time scale. How long will it take? We don't know. How like how many people you need? We don't know. Are we secure yet? We don't know. So like, if this project takes months or even years, it's kind of hard to keep buying there because like someone's paying you to secure all this stuff. And when you said, oh yeah, I'm just going to secure it all. And then a year later, it's still not all secure. It's kind of like, well, what work are you doing and where? So a use case is generally used to refer to a specific condition or event, uh, usually a specific threat to be detected or reported by a security tool. And generally, when well, like whenever like security engineers talk about a use case, it'll go all the way from the like high level attacker motivation. So who's targeting this and why? Like, is it a business critical asset? Is there like is there data to be stolen? All the way down to the mitigation uh, reward. If we can't mitigate it, the detection of the uh, of the of the um, of the indicator of compromise there. Um, and generally, seeing as the purpose of a use case is to make these security issues addressable. It'll generally include a playbook for an analyst to follow as well. So once this is flagged up in your security tool of choice, whether that be Splunk or an Elk stack or whatever, then the, the analyst who's reading it and monitoring it can actually take an action from that to help resolve the issue because although you can identify it and although you can detect it, you still need to, you know, actually do something about it. Um, and generally, we, um, we would use a framework to pick which use cases to do. So Instead of you know becoming the the subject matter expert in literally everything in your enterprise, you can instead turn to people who are already like you can get a like a good inventory list of what you have, and then say okay, so which platforms do we have, and have we covered the entire kill chain? So can you? Use, I take it you can't see this uh, this uh, this chart at the bottom at the back. Okay, so um, essentially it goes from the uh, fr from the start of the kill chain, so initial access to, or well, near the start of the kill chain. For so from essentially as far as close to the start of the kill chain as we can do something about it, because like reconnaissance and OSINT, we can't really like aside from you know like good data hygiene, we can't really do much about that. But it goes all the way from initial access to command and control and exfiltration, collection, lateral movement, discovery, credential access, the defense evasion, and like it'll give. So this is the MITRE attack framework in particular, and this will give a summary of each of the individual vulnerabilities and that list goes way way down but it would, it would never fit on a slide so it'll give a summary of uh, each individual vulnerability or each individual like uh, tactic uh, used by attackers on each platform and then following one of these so like uh, like anyone in our organization could go okay given enough time how are we with all of these like a uh, with each of these boxes, what are we doing to detect it and what are we doing to stop it? So that's a good way for you to change the problem of let's just fix the security of our enterprise into here's how we're going to fix the security of our enterprise bit by bit. And we know exactly wh where we stand with each piece. And when something changes, so let's say like we get new, like we get new tech in or we migrate the server, we can again reference this chart to say kind of, okay, where are we in terms of the plug in the holes? Um, and generally, the development of a use case, although there are the, there are tons of frameworks for developing them, and there's lots of different like uh, like ideologies on on what's the best way. Generally, it's something like this. So it starts off with like an objective, like what are you trying to what are you trying to do? Stop getting hacked usually. And then threat. So what what's the threat of happening? What's the risk here? Um, so who's who and stakeholders? Who is responsible not only for like actively working with that asset or with that uh, part of the business, but then who would also be involved in the process of fixing it or the process of mitigating it, or if it's, uh, if it's a data breach, who, who would be involved legally, so on. What data will we need to, 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 to monitor and detect it? What logic would we need to filter out the events we don't want? And then we'd uh, test that logic, and then we'd assign a priority to it. So given the... Given the and I initially found it quite weird the priority was at the end, because surely... You'd assess the priority before you start development on it, and that way you can fix the, the hardest things first. But different vulnerabilities will have different um, issues with detecting them, and depending on how well and or reliably you can detect them, it um, might be it might have a different priority. So it does it does ultimately make sense to decide on uh, 
how mid how 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 major an alert or an event is um at the end. So I'm going to run through very briefly. There are some there are, there, there are some parts I skip over, and if anyone's super familiar with Windows internals or Kerberos specifically, you're going to be raging because this really doesn't cover uh, the half of what it should. But it's a three minute slot, so that's okay. Um, so essentially, the Kerberos attack um, is a, is an attack on Windows Kerberos, which allows a, an attacker to who already has an account on the domain to escalate their privileges to an account which owns a service switch. And generally, accounts which have services attached to them have higher privileges just be, like just because of the way enterprises work. I mean, like if if, if you're running uh, like a batch service, like generally you're not just going to be you know like a like someone who works in sales or so on and so forth. So. But on that, on the uh, attack matrix, the minor attack uh, uh, framework I showed you earlier, that would come under credential access, which uh, is, it's not like, it definitely does not need fixed if like, or sorry, okay, that's wrong, it does need fixed. It definitely isn't the most urgent thing to be fixed, of course, because it's not, you know, like initial access, it's not open to the internet, but it certainly is a consideration if you're looking to look at the security of your organization in like a holistic way and actually make decisions about it. And the reason we don't want Kerberos, or the Kerberos thing is that, well, yeah, I, I, I talked about the um, uh, service council of higher privileges and Kerberos ticket logs are not stored by default. So unless we actively take it to our, at least in the 2016 server, they're not stored by default. And I'm not sure if it's changed, but um, the if, if you're not making an active effort to address this vulnerability, it might go completely unlogged. It might be like, it might go completely undetected and that's, you know, not something you want. Um, and ultimately, like the reason why you're hearing about this here and not on like a on, like front page headline saying Windows is broken is that when you, an entire enterprise follows best practices. So for instance, we only create services under managed service accounts, which have very, very strong passwords and are very, uh, and like an, and are very safe and managed services in a very sensible way. Or we have, you know, a strong password for the account we're creating the service on. Or we enable the AES Kerberos encryption, which isn't always done because I guess it's slower and it's it takes time, etc. Um, so when when all those best practices are followed, we don't have to detect this at all because it's not an issue, right? If someone, well, I'll go into how it works exactly in a second. But the point I'm trying to make here is that detections don't always have to be uh, okay. We've wrote a detection; we detect it all the time. It just has to lower the risk to the organization. So if the reality is that not all enterprises are perfect, then we should definitely write rules to detect what happens when it's like something slips up or policy isn't followed or like uh and, and like an admin makes a like a fast like a fast fix and then that fast fix stays there for three years, you know, it's like things like that. So um in order to understand uh Kerberos thing, we need to understand Kerberos. So who do you hear knows how Kerberos works first? Yeah, that's what the <laughs> so essentially, Kerberos is a is a ticketing based authentication system, and it's, so it's uh, this is good because it allows a single sign on or aid single sign on, and stops you from just like sending on the network and listening for like a like a client sending a password to the DC. Um, and the most important thing is essentially the key distribution center contains two services: the authentication service, which you don't really care about, and the ticket granting service. So when I log in. Originally, when I log into Windows and authenticate myself, I'll use the authentication service. Do I exist? Yes, am I on the domain? Fantastic. And then they'll give me a, uh, a ticket granting ticket once I uh, log in. And using this ticket granting ticket, I can then use that to ask the um, key distribution center for a service ticket for a particular service. And the, um, the interesting thing about this is that once... Um, the way the service ticket works is I then, as a client, I will take that to the to the network resource I'm accessing or service or um, like resource or whatever. And the way they know that that is legitimate is that it's encrypted with their own secret. So, like, if I'm a network resource and I, and I know my password's password, I just use my secret to decrypt the service ticket, and I know that that's a legitimate ticket because I can decrypt it and I can read it because it's using my secret. And the the uh, key distribution center issued that ticket and I trust them, so where go I trust this thing. But the issue with that is that when we it enables anyone who requests a service ticket to have access to that hash or that um a secret, sorry. And that in in this case is the hash. And with old assets, uh so anything before Windows Server 2008, I think, would use a very, very old RC4 implementation of the uh 
the encryption, which means that cracking them offline isn't particularly stressful and like the, the margin of where we consider a crackable password goes down quite significantly. So this is a, although it is only a credential access, this is a very real issue and it is quite, it is something that we need to manage on a detection level as well. So, um, essentially how, how an attack would work would be we enumerate users who who have, have, have servers, and we can do that with set SPN, we can do that with basic PowerShell. Um, we can grab the hash from the service ticket when we request it using uh, using certain tools or Mimikatz or whatever. Uh, and then we can crack it offline away from, uh, like, obviously the AD is not going to hear about it if we crack it offline because that's something we can do anywhere. And then, voila, we've got credentials provided it's, uh, yeah, provided it's um, uh, the, the password's weak enough. So, how do we stop this? We can follow, again, follow best practices, but that's not really a security strategy as it is a, like a pie in the sky dream. Um, so we're going to have to try and detect it. And then once we spot it, we can then take an action to like secure it then because like software isn't perfect, right? So if we create our own environment with no noise, this is going to be easy to identify. And there are going to be, uh, I am going to, I'm going to show you how I built up to essentially have a, having a curb, curb roasting detection, but this isn't going to work realistically in an enterprise environment without some sort of like change to it because again as I said enterprises aren't perfect and that is the the battle we're dealing with and that's fine I mean like it's not like I don't have to wait until everyone else does their jobs perfectly and before I can start improving security so that's no problem um, generally the um, things in an enterprise which will help searches like this is specifically with curb roasting I had to think um Service accounts that they may use a third party program to track and like deal and deal with the security of service accounts. So whenever we search for uh, people requesting like tickets, there's going to be a few accounts which come up an awful lot more. So if we had like some kind of lookup or some kind of centralized like repository for these accounts, we can filter them out. That's no problem. Um, again, if you've got an active purple team or a red team, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure I like the term purple team, but uh, essentially. Internally at, uh, at Sophos, we have a team which tests other departments and then uses that information to feed back to them and say, hey guys, this is what we need to be doing better as a, as a group. This is what we need to be like, like having this setup is bad and then so on and so forth. So again, they're likely to be curb roasting so we can filter these out and, um, a proper threshold for how many service tickets is too many because if you've got quite a large AD, there's a, or if you, if you've got quite a large, uh, large environment, there's going to be like, generally a lot of service tickets being used. So um, that will uh, specify uh, from uh, person to person. So moving on quickly, it's not too much time I've got left. Uh, building a local testing environment. Um, you were eight minutes, mate. Thanks. So hang on, what, what, what's happened to my slides? Okay, th this isn't supposed to be animated. I got scared there. I thought I'd have to slide thing. But um, essentially what we need to test this involves a domain controller with its own domain. Uh, a victim privileged account with a dodgy, easy to crack password. And the reason it has to be privileged is just so we can demonstrate that this can be used for credential access for like privilege escalation. Um, an improperly registered service tied to the victim account with the poor password that we shouldn't do, but that's fine. And then on the attacker side, we're going to need a single Windows client detected to that, uh, connected to that ID domain. A client account, preferably unprivileged, again to demonstrate the privilege uh, escalation aspect to it. Oh, yep, there we go. That says it there. So. How on earth do we do this? Well, I mean, the setting up locally on your own box is preferable because, I mean, I know how many of you are students, but certainly as a student, I, I, I wouldn't be able to afford AWS or anything like that. So uh, Windows images are freely available as evaluation copies. Um, I'm pretty sure this includes all on, all the new server ones as well. Um, it does go back quite a while, so you can get a copy of Windows 7, which or even Vista to test the uh, the um, the per, the per en encryption thing I was talking about. Um, so essentially, once you have your two images, just spin them up and uh, and set them up. Um, stick them on the same internal network. And there's a lot of and there's and as far as setting them up goes, I'm quite limited in time here. And there's a lot of people who know a lot more about ID than I do, who can tell you the exact best practice way to do things and the reason why things are. Um, so. Again, I was going to stick the whole link in, but if you literally Google setting up an Active Directory Lab Part 1, that's the first result. And then if you're looking for home lab guides which specifically point to curb roasting and about like setting up massive environments which like simulate real service traffic and that sort of thing so you can test an actual detection, which takes a, a, a lot of time, 
um, you can go to um, the Late Red blog, which is run by uh, my exploit twenty six hundred and um, sub eax, which who ran a great workshop on this last Steelcon last year, and so I so shout out to those guys. And um, Seth Sex blog on uh, Pen Test Home Lab, which I followed myself, which is a great resource. There's a few, there's a there's a few really good things um, on that site. So again, the, assuming we've set it up to use it, so we need to find the tools. So again, curb roasting is literally just requesting the um, service principal name. So whenever I set up a service attached to an account, if it requires authentication, then I'll need to like a, set up an, S, an SPN or service principal name for it. So with raw PowerShell, you can pretty easily, pretty easily enumerate through the um, service principal names on the domain, and then uh, find out which accounts are attached to them, and then you can go, okay, is this is this a computer account? Because um, most services or some services will be on computer accounts, which do have strong default passwords, so they're a no go. So you can find specifically services running on user accounts, or you can use. Um, so these are these are GitHub. Um, so if you like, if you just search Ghostpack slash Rubius, you'll find the GitHub page, um, and this is the latest and greatest uh, curb roasting uh, framework uh, made in C sharp by 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 a guy called Harmjoy, who is who knows a lot about this stuff and has a lot of resources about Kerberos and breaking it and messing with it to attack. Um, and then uh, Nidim has a has a couple oh, excuse me has a couple of curb roasting scripts which are quite helpful and don't run in C sharp. So if you're literally just if you've just got the environment and you just want to run a script, then that's also great. But it's also I mean it takes a wee while to get working. So assuming we do that and run through it. We've then got, um, the, this is what it looked like. So this is the uh, full event, uh, Windows event 4769. But the things that you want to pay attention to are the service information up there, so the service name, and then the ticket options, ticket encryption type, and failure code. So obviously, we're not interested in uh, requests for tickets that don't fail. Um, we're interested in specific encryption types there. And um, I didn't include it in the slide, but I think it's uh, OX17, OX12, and... I think, I think I'll say I'm not sure. I'll, I'll find that out. Um, and essentially, do you see that? The dollar sign that the uh, service name ends in means it's associated with a computer account, and that's no good to us. So we need to search for uh, services which don't have that. That's another limiter we can do. Um, so yeah, here's. And also, a lot of the. If, if, if you opt, thank you. If you opt for this. Uh, welcome, everyone. If you opt for this uh, um, logging. Oh, <laughs> a bit late, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, a lot of the uh, requests will be for KRB TGT, which is for the ticket granting service. So like that's not going to get the curb roasted. So we can get that out. We can filter out machine accounts. We can filter out uh, things which fail. And we can uh, look for the um, ticket encryption type. So once we, this is all still in Windows. This is all still still in our environments. If you'd also want to set up some sort of like same type application, we can talk about Elk very quickly. So Elk is a uh, is the Elastic Stack, uh, which is not its official name. I should really stop using Elk. But essentially, um, you ingest data with um, Logstash and Beats. Oh. Castle, yeah, sorry. Uh, so essentially, beats are the essentially like like a if anyone's familiar with Splunk, they're essentially a forwarder. Uh, there's a different type for different data, and they've all got different configuration options, which I think is dumb, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not about me. Um, and then Logstash takes those logs in and um, and indexes them correctly. And then you can use Elasticsearch, which is a, a similar to Splunk processing language in which you can search the data, and then Kibana puts it all in the lovely uh, dashboards and nice lists for you. And it also allows you to set up uh, like similar, uh, similar things to Splunk do, which is like uh, scheduled searches and alerts and dashboards and so on. So, with this detection, looks something like this. And again, I know it's not very visible, but we can see on the very left the event ID is four seven six nine. Um, it doesn't end in a dollar sign. It is not the ticket granting service. Um, I, I I genuinely can't read it. The that angle. That's another machine name filter. And we know it passed, and we've got the encryption type. So it's quite literally like looking at, okay, so that's essentially it. So don't try to work, because there's no real support for Elk. We can use a whole bunch of other ones, um, <laughs> essentially. You know, because I mean, I, 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 I don't work with Elk. I, I, I wouldn't ever like put money on Elk, because it crashes far too much. Essentially, the takeaway, enterprise security is pretty messy. Kerberos is scuffed. And building a lab is a great way to spend your time because it teaches you so much about deep technical concepts that you really have no place to learn anywhere else. Any questions? Hi. Yeah.
you think it's uh, feasible like, and realistic you know, in the real world to solely base your detection on Windows Log Events? Mm. Or do you need other products? Well like, a, well, like ADR products, like like OS Query and stuff to monitor. Yeah, I'm all like, looking at... Uh, um, I haven't looked at it, and I'm far too junior to know from experience, but I would definitely say if there was a EDR tool, um, endpoint detection response tool, or something similar, which didn't rely on Windows, Windows log events and the agent, because uh, my issue with these type of things are the agent to deploy it takes so long, and like an entire environment, it's probably not worth it. But I think we're out of time. How do, are we completely out of time? for? Okay, so thank you so much for your questions, but uh, I'm thankful for this.